Good evening, everyone. My name is Lacey Ballinger, and I'm Director of Collections and Exhibits at the Tallahassee Museum. Thank you for joining us for this week's installment of Museum Mixology. As you know, we started this series during the pandemic. So um, we started it as a idea for those of you who were sheltering at home uh, to enjoy a happy hour for a way to learn, a way to have a date night, a way to um, just experience uh, learning um, in a different environment, um, whether it be uh, one of our topics for cocktails and crime, sipping with science, or toast to history. Um, we have them uh, bi-monthly now on Thursday evenings at 6 p.m. Eastern. So we do try to limit it to our adult audience because most, a lot of times we do have adult topics. So um, we want to try to limit that, but we also have family enjoyment as well. So we wanna make sure that we uh, recognize if you do have family that you wanna let them come enjoy it um, and let you know when we do have um, a all age friendly topics. Um, tonight would not be one of those, um, but uh, the next time we have one, it will be family friendly. So um, if you are so inclined, you'd like to donate to the museum um, you'd like us to continue this series, uh, I put the tip jar link in the chat room. Um, and as I said, some weeks we will be discussing topics that are difficult or sensitive. Um, so we, it is our duty as a museum to interpret those and contextualize those political, social, or cultural history topics that might be um, sensitive due to current events or um, just in general based on your personal beliefs. So we strive to have an honest and open minded learning experience um, where it's safe to, ex to express your own opinions. Um, tonight's, speaker, uh, tonight's speaker, Sarah Bailey, is from the Center for Biological Diversity, which is a national nonprofit conservation organization with more than 1.7 million members and online activists dedicated to, uh, dedicated to the protection of endangered species in wild places. Her title is the Population and Sustainability Organizer and she has worked on projects like the Endangered Species Condoms Project and coordinating events for Pillow Talk, which is an outreach program geared towards museum and science center visitors. Uh, she helps people make the connection between unsustainable human population growth and its negative effect on wildlife and their habitat. Uh, she supports campaigns to advocate for comprehensive sex education and reproductive health rights as solutions that are good for people and the planet. Sarah holds a bachelor's in wildlife conservation from the University of Delaware and a master's in biology from Villanova University. She's also, I believe, um, this may be out of date, she may be done by now, but she's been working on a master's of public administration at the University of Arizona. And before joining the Center for Biological Diversity, she worked as an environmental educator and lab coordinator. So Sarah, I am going to turn it over to you. And we are going to talk about saving the birds and the bees. Hey, thanks, Lisa, for having me. Um, I'm super excited to get to present to you all. Um, even though I don't actually get to be in Florida, um, I am presenting from uh, Western New York. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Wen Ho Rin Lim um, of the Wen Ho indigenous people. And yeah, like Lacey said, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about helping the birds and the bees with safe sex and um, some of the work we do at the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, so just a little bit of background about the center in case you haven't heard of us. Um, like Lacey said, we are a national environmental nonprofit. And um, our main goal is advocating for endangered species. And um, we've been around for over 30 years. And in that time, we've helped over 700 million uh, endangered species be protected and help protect over 500 million acres of critical habitat. And we do this uh, using science, law, and creative media. So what that means is we have a lot of scientists who are studying the habitat of these species, what they need, um, what goes into deciding critical habitat designations. And then we have lawyers uh, protecting environmental legislation um, through litigation. Um, all that being said, <laughs> I work within our population and sustainability program that does not have any lawyers or scientists and we are more focused on outreach and education. Um, and I will get more into that now. Um, so, I just want to draw your attention to the image on the left of the slide. So that's a fun little infographic that kind of just shows the wide range of species and type of um, organisms that we help protect. Um, so it's kind of color coded in shapes 
So going from the inside of the circle out, uh, the little white critters represent reptiles. The teal is amphibians. The orange is birds. The yellow is mammals. The blue is fish. The purple is invertebrates. And the green is plants. And each little image uh, represents an individual species. So we really run the whole gamut from like little mussels and plants to big charismatic megafauna um, like grizzlies and wolves and everything in between. Um, so what are we up against as an environmental organization? Um, we're facing a lot of habitat destruction and really rapid concerning species loss, um, the ever increasing threat of climate change. Um, but what is ultimately driving all of these threats? Um, so common answers to that question are fossil fuels, um, agriculture and pollution that's associated kind of with both those big industries. But we are the common denominator. Um, not to say that those previous answers are, um, aren't correct, they definitely are, um, but ultimately the number of people on the planet is going to be driving all of those threats even more. Um, the more people we have, the more food we need to feed them all, space we need to house them, and just kind of general resources um, in general to be able to support everyone. So just to give you kind of some quick stats and facts about human population growth over the years, it's been a really uh, fairly recent, you know, in the history of human population, a fairly recent uptick in the last 50 years. Um, and currently we're adding over 200,000 people per day. Um, and that are, that's um, a gross addition of like, once you also um, take out deaths as well, it's 200,000 new pe uh, 200, people every day. Um, and we're at about 7.8 billion people now, and we are projected to hit 11 billion by the end of the century. And then to look at how this human population growth correlates with um, the extinction, our species extinction and species loss. So on this graph, um, the x-axis is showing you uh, time by year of the last 200 or so years. And then on the left, it's um, number of extinctions and the right y-axis is um, human population growth. And that purple line is indicating uh, the human population by millions. And you can see how it really just kind of goes from a steady incline to a sharp, um, steep incline um, about you know, 70 years, 50 to 70 years ago. Um, and you'll see the extinction rate is really closely correlated with it. And then on the right of this slide is a handful of recent studies. These are all from um, 2020, just particularly quantifying how human population growth and human activity impact species. So that first one at the top, intense human pressure is widespread across terrestrial vertebrate ranges. What that study looked at was how kind of all kinds of human activity cumulatively affects species ranges. So they looked at um, various infrastructure like roads and power lines, um, train tracks, just kind of all these things um, together that support, you know, human life and human activity. And they looked at over 20,000 species. And what they found was, I believe, um, over 80% were, their range was extremely impacted. So like a certain percentage of the range was impacted. So, and there's like a lot of ways this can happen. Like you think you build a road through a range, um, the road doesn't maybe take up that much space, but it, you know, divides up territories. It becomes a thing that species have to cross. Um, so it's important to look at how like all these impacts work together and it affects species. The next one down is global wildlife being decimated by human actions. Um, and that's from a World Wildlife Fund report. And then um, the last one at the bottom looked at the past and future um, human impact on mammalian diversity. And I believe that study looked at um, kind of the migration and colonization of people and how that could be a predictor for um, species loss in mammals. Um, so a lot of those are kind of big numbers and graphs and headlines, uh, but I want to give you some specific examples about species loss and kind of what that's looked like over the years. Um, so my first example is a very classic one in wildlife conservation studies, and it's the passenger pigeon. So this is, it looks super common, like a lot of doves we have today, close relative of the um, rock pigeons we still have around. Um, these birds um, probably numbered in like the millions um, back in the 1800s. And there's descriptions of when they would flock and fly across the sky. It could be a sunny, you know, sunny midday and it could darken the sky with how many there were. 
So there were a lot of them. So who would think they'd go anywhere? Um, and just they were very easy pickings for hunting. And um, by the early 1900s, we'd wipe them out. Um, and part of that is because of their, bio their species biology. So part of their um, breeding biology is kind of grouping together and having these large flocks. So at a certain point, if you just don't have enough birds to do that, they're not gonna breed. It's not just a matter of like having a breeding pair. You need like this whole group um, for this behavior they'd have. Um, so that's one example of just like, even when something seems very plentiful, um, if we're not paying attention and just kind of take without consideration, we can very quickly wipe out a plentiful species. And that picture in the top right is Martha. She was like the last uh, pigeon. Um, I'm gonna say she was at a zoo in Ohio. Um, and this is a very a much more like localized current species that's still around. This is the Bethany beach firefly. You can find it in Southern Delaware. And this is a species the Center for Biological Diversity works on. Um, so they have a very small range um, in coastal Delaware. And it's very popular for development because who doesn't like to have a vacation down the beach? So that's what that bottom left picture is indicating. Um, a lot of their habitat is very popular for that. They also face threats from mosquito spraying. So once you have people in the area, um, and coastal areas tend to have marshes and bays and everything that mosquitoes also like, but people on vacation don't like mosquitoes. <laughs> um, so they get sprayed and those can, that spray can also, um, those pesticides can negatively affect uh, the fireflies as well. Um, so we are trying to prevent further development in their very tiny range um, to ensure that the species sticks around. Um, Cause they're pretty cool. If you've ever seen fireflies um, up on the East coast, like it's a pretty spectacular thing to see in the summer. Um, this next guy is the Hellbender. Uh, they also have a really fun nickname called Snot Otter, which I love. And they are the largest uh, amphibian in North America. Um, I always like to have the pictures showing them in people's hands to get an idea for scale. They're, they're big guys. Um, so there's a few different species of them in different areas. So um, the different species have smaller ranges, but um, being amphibians, they are always near water. So they face a lot of threats for water pollution. And a lot of that comes from agriculture, whether that's manure runoff or pesticides, um, it gets in the water and with that thin skin, um, they're very sensitive to it, um, especially when they're laying their eggs in the water as well. Then we've got mountain lions. Um, so, you know, these are really, um, used to be all over North America and now their range has been really drastically reduced. One of the biggest threats they face actually in Florida is, um, highway road, or I mean anywhere, but I know this is an issue in Florida particularly, is highway roads. Um, so big mammals like this that are solitary need a lot of space to roam around. Um, so again, like I was describing earlier, these impacts on range is you build a road that may not take up a large percentage of their range, but if it cuts it in half, that is an area they need to cross, whether they're looking for food or water or a mate. Um, so that's actually car collisions is one of the big threats they're facing now. Um, I should put the little picture of the little cubs. They're very cute. Um, just a few more species examples, um, you know, to be a little more positive, this is a success story. So the California condor was um, almost wiped out to extinction a couple decades ago. Um, I think it were, they were in the single digits of individuals and there was a collaborative effort um, through a bunch of organizations in um, California, I believe, maybe some other southwestern states where they brought in all the wild ones for a captive breeding program. Um, and it was really successful. Um, so that top left picture is a hand puppet feeding a baby condor because they didn't want them to imprint on people. Uh, the picture below that, it has the tags with the numbers. Um, if you go areas, um, go to areas where they hang out in the Southwest, you can see them flying, you can see what number they are um, without even binoculars or anything. It's pretty cool because you can see how like pretty much all California condors out there now have come from this captive breeding program or are um, related to individuals from it. And uh, they actually celebrated their 1,000th one one thousand hatchling uh, last summer. So it's been a very successful program. Um, so they do still face threats from lead ammunition and carcasses. Um, you know, they're scavengers. So if you shoot something with lead, um, it's there and they can get that poisoning from eating the meat. So the, um, there is starting to be a lead ammunition ban in certain areas of the Southwest. Um, they also still face habitat destruction. That'll be kind of a common thread through a lot of species. Um, and that's always an important thing to think about with captive breeding and species recovery programs is it's great if we can bring the numbers back out, up, but if we don't protect the habitat they need to go back out into that we you know, eventually want to reach them back out in, 
um, it's not going to be a very long-term success. So it is important to make sure we're maintaining that habitat um, to get the species back out. Um, and the top right is some of our condom art from the endangered species condoms. Before your clothes hit the floor, think of the California condor. Another cool little species is the flat-tailed horned lizard. Um, so these little guys also found in the Southwest, um, Texas, Arizona, there's a few different species of horned lizards around. So their biggest threats are sprawl. So he's, as you can see on that bottom center picture, um, you know, these suburban communities and then, you know, on the other side of the road is wide sprawling desert in Southwest, there's a lot of room to like for cities to grow out. Um, so that's an issue for them along with off-roading. Um, so, you know, just kind of driving around in areas that don't have roads. Um, if you look at those pictures, they blend in with the sand really well. So chances are, especially from a big truck, you won't see these little guys um, in time to avoid them. Um, and just a fun uh, biology fact about them, that bottom left picture, uh, when they feel threatened, they will shoot blood out of their eye. So that's what that is a picture of. It's not injured, uh, that's just a defense mechanism. And that's another one on our condoms. Uh, for the sake of the horned lizard, slow down, love wizard. Then we've got monarch butterflies. This is definitely one of like the more widespread species we work on. So uh, monarchs face a lot of threats, again, from agriculture. Um, so it's the pesticides they spray is also harmful to butterflies. Um, they also face a lot of habitat loss as we um, kind of remove uh, native vegetation for more monoculture crops like soybeans and corn. And what's interesting about a lot of those crops in particular is they aren't even for feeding people necessarily, they're for feeding livestock um, to feed people. Um, so it's sort of how these um, certain threats can kind of then spread out. So we need space for livestock and everything, and then we also need space to grow their food. So these are those ripple effects of um, certain resources. Um, and they have a really unique migration pattern. Um, so they will migrate up from the Midwest down to Mexico. And actually it's multiple generations that do that. I used to think it was like one butterfly made that whole trip. Um, but it's multiple generations happening along the way. And you can see how kind of right in the middle of that map is uh, the Corn Belt. So that's kind of a major area now where there is no um, native vegetation for them. And it's really important um, for the adults to be able to lay their eggs on milkweed so the caterpillars have that as food. Um, and also it's important to have um, good flowers with nectar for the adults to drink uh, on their way down. So like cone flowers, um, there's all kinds of good native uh, plants that you can plant for the adult monarchs. Sea otter is another cute one. Um, they are another one that was hunted almost to extinction for fur hunting um, a while ago, and they've since made a comeback, which is really important because they are known as a keystone species. That means they kind of like are a, have a very critical role in their ecosystem. So for sea otters, what that is, is they will eat, they eat sea urchins. Um, and if, when you don't have enough sea otters keeping the sea urchins in check, the sea urchins will decimate the kelp forest. And that kind of throws the whole ocean ecosystem out of whack. Um, so besides being cute, they serve a very critical role. <laughs> um, but they still face threats today from offshore drilling and uh, commercial fishing. They can often get caught up in the nets as unintentional bycatch. Um, so at the center, we are working to stop further offshore drilling um, off of California. Um, and there's another one on the endangered species condoms before it gets any hotter, remember the sea otter. Then we've got the whooping crane. Um, these birds are really cool. Another one where kind of we have had a nice help in bringing their numbers back up. Um, that top center picture is a person flying a plane and helps them um, teach the new birds their migration route. They have a really spectacular mating dance that's very cool to see. Um, but the fact, you know, they face the same threats a lot of these other ones do, habitat destruction. Um, power lines are a big issue for them. As you can see in that bottom right picture, you know, they're all taking off um, from these feeding grounds and that's, that's an obstacle they have to face while flying. Um, and just kind of further industrialization, um, they're often found around wetlands for feeding and um, winter migration. And those are areas that are, you know, further being developed. Um, and that phrase for the condoms is, can't refrain, remember the whooping crane. All right, so all this is, you know, why do we, so um, at the center, we focus on US population growth in particular. Um, and this is due to our outsized consumption, which I will get into a little more. Um, per person, 
each person in the US has a much larger impact compared to any other individual in any other country. Um, and we also have a need to improve reproductive equity and autonomy within the US. So Americans have one of the largest carbon footprints in the world per an individual. So this graphic on the right, the blue footprint represents the estimated average for a US resident, which is 20 tons of carbon dioxide emitted per year. Then you see that little green footprint next to it, which is the estimated average for the world, with the US included, is only four tons. So already we're five times the uh, global average. And then you might say, well, I, you know, actually like ride my bike to work or maybe I'm working from home now. I eat a lot plant-based diet. My footprint's probably much lower. Um, the estimated average um, carbon emissions for a homeless person in the US is 8.5 tons. All that is to say, a, even a very low impact lifestyle in the US um, is still double that of the world just because of there's certain services and impacts that we kind of like all take responsibility for in the US or kind of all like goes into figuring out our carbon footprint. Um, so what it's called is like the basement for your footprint can only be so low here. And this uh, graph is from a study that came out a few years ago. Um, I think it's really interesting. It reviewed various green actions, um, some of which you've probably heard of like recycling and switching to a hybrid car and buying green energy. And it quantified the impact of all the study, um, of, of all the actions. Because often you may know all these good things you can do, but you don't know how they compare to each other. So along the x-axis, uh, you have all the different uh, actions, upgrade your light bulbs, hang your laundry to dry, recycle, wash your clothes in cold water, switch to a hybrid car, um, adopting a plant-based diet, buying green energy, canceling a transatlantic flight, not using a car at all, and having one less child. And you can see um, that left on the y-axis is the number of tons of carbon emissions saved per a year by taking that action. And the kid one is much higher. <laughs> It is nearly six, it saves nearly 60 tons of CO2 emissions per year in the US by having one less kid. Um, not, that is not to say to not have kids, it's just one of those things of people just don't often know the impact and that's, you know, something we want to educate people on. So I opened up with how, say, saying how safe sex saves wildlife. So if that connection is not clear yet, I'm going to walk through an infographic that kind of connects the dots. So as the world population grows, so do its demands for water, land, trees, and fossil fuels. Voluntary family planning can help reduce pressure on the planet. By understanding this relationship, access to contraception and sex education can be an integral part of the environmental movement. So the first step is reducing unplanned pregnancies. So whether someone prefers condoms, birth control pills, or an IUD, an intrauterine device, um, using contraceptive decreases unplanned pregnancies, often leading to lower fertility rates. So that's our main area of focus is not just telling people to not have kids or anything like that. We want to reduce unplanned pregnancies in the U.S. Um, that rate is al almost 50% of all pregnancies here are unplanned or unintended. And this helps, so by um, having these resources available for, you know, accessible contraceptions, this helps increase empowerment for women and girls. So with improved access to contraception, reproductive health care, and education, women and girls can choose to, and delay, choose to delay having children or have smaller, and have smaller families. And usually, you know, if you tend to delay having kids, it probably equals a smaller family as well. Those kind of go hand in hand. And all this can leave more room for wildlife. Uh, population pressure pushes wildlife out of their homes and closer to extinction. Reducing unplanned pregnancies helps leave more food, water, and shelter for wildlife to thrive. And this helps us all build resilience. So when people are able to make the right reproductive decisions for themselves, um, the benefits to their health, families, and the environment help build resilient communities. And these are just a couple, uh, sorry, a couple other fun illustrations we have uh, that acknowledge the other forms of contraception out there. So we have IUDs put the power in you to save the mountain caribou. A pill a day gives the Northern Rockies fisher more room to play. Plan B helps when there's been a mistake, saving you and the Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake. And we have these on little cards. And then on the back is a QR code um, that takes folks to a website that kind of reviews all the forms of contraception out there. Um, we give out the condoms um, and they're great. You know, they help with disease protection. Um, they're easy to hand out, but they're not the only thing out there. And we want people to know, you know, not the same thing what isn't the right option for everyone. So we want everyone to be more educated about the resources out there. 
And these are just some other fun illustrations from past, um, I guess, rounds of condoms we've had. So we have cover your Tweedle, save the burying beetle, use a stopper, save the hopper, wear a Jimmy hat, save the big cat, rock with care, save the polar bear, hump smarter, save the snail darter, and wear a cat, uh, condom now, save the spotted owl. And I should explain, I guess, a quick... So the condoms we give out, they're little cardboard packages like the size of a pack of gum. And then there's condoms inside with more information. So that's what these the illustrations are the outside of. And then some other designs we've had, don't go bare, panthers are rare. When you're feeling tender, think about the hellbender. Be a savvy lover, protect, protect the snowy plover. In the sack, save the leatherback. Um, got the polar bear again. Um, safe intercourse saves the dwarf seahorse. Um, so we've got all these fun ways to talk about population. We've got lots of graphs and information, but not people sometimes don't want to talk about this. And this, I always put in this comment because I think it does a good illustration of the, how those conversations sometimes go. So we've got to deal with the root cause of global warming. Right, let's talk about sustainability. Let's talk clean energy, sustainable agriculture, carbon footprints. Actually, how about we talk about sustainable human population? Sorry, we don't talk about that. So why don't want people want to talk about that? So often there are a lot of, um, sometimes we'll make associations with population control, coercion, eco-fascism, genocide, eugenics, and closing borders. And those are not our philosophy. We are advocating for human rights, reproductive rights, quality of life, social justice, also that we can have a thriving people and planet. So some common misconceptions that come up when talking about um, human population growth is that population pressure is just about the number of people. Um, and we always um, reiterate that consumption uh, patterns play a part as well. So like I said earlier about how um, folks in the United States have a larger impact, um, that's why we also need to address population growth here as well. Um, and that can also that also gets into a whole thing of like individual versus systemic change of like, yes, we also need to regulate corporations and make sure they're not polluting an insane amount. Um, and there's not there's no quick and easy solutions um, in the sense of just dictating the number of children people can have with policies. Um, what we need are comprehensive strategies that incorporate a rights based approach from many angles and denounce any coercive policies. Other misconceptions. Um, is dismissing these conversations altogether. Um, you know, whether it's seen as too big a problem or just too tough to deal with, this, uh, solutions are too complicated. Um, some people just choose to ignore it. Um, but if we don't talk about population pressures at all, we miss a chance to promote the just and equitable solutions. Um, and then there's also perpetuating false dichotomies of either or thinking. And that there's, you know, there's folks will be, it's just population, it's just consumption, um, focusing on certain countries rather than others. Um, but really we need a combination of approaches and solutions to address the impacts of population pressure. There's so many different ways to work on this. And then there's often a lack of gender inclusivity and equity in these conversations. Um, and it's important, you know, often, sometimes all the pressure is put on women um, to kind of, um, make all the family planning decisions and men aren't always incorporated into that. Um, other groups are left out entirely. Um, and equity is about everyone feeling empowered, um, but we must remove barriers to allow for everyone to have access and agency over their bodies. And then often suggested how certain people shouldn't have children um, for any number of reasons, but everyone should have the right to have or not have children. So what are we doing about all this? Um, so our goal is to bring population back into the conversation, in particular um, as an environmental issue. And we do this by focusing on ethical, non-coercive solutions. So as I've kind of been sprinkling the illustrations throughout, we have our Endangered Species Condoms Project that has been around for 11 years. And um, the goal was just kind of how do we get people talking about population and was, you know, what if we actually gave them a tool <laughs> to prevent unplanned pregnancies? Um, so that's been a really successful program over the years. We've had um, hundreds if not thousands of volunteers giving out the condoms nationwide over the years. Um, whether it's on their campus, their youth groups, just to friends and family at events. 
um, all kinds of cool places. We also have our Pillow Talk Outreach Program. So that is where we um, particularly partner with zoos, museums, and science centers like the Tallahassee Museum. And um, whether it's um, speaking engagements or tabling at events, just kind of getting that message out there to an audience who's interested. Um, and then other out we do other outreach programs on campuses, in coalitions, at conferences, at environmental education centers, through the media, um, public events, and doing survey and focus groups. So yeah, like I said, the condoms themselves work as a great icebreaker tool. Um, it's helping bring it back into the conversation. There's information on the inside that you know discusses these rights-based effective solutions. And it uses humor to make this topic more approachable. So all these goofy puns um, get people laughing and that makes this a lot a much easier conversation to have. Um, whereas some people might feel a little more shy about taking condoms from a bowl, like if they were just like the unwrapped foil packets, but you know, if they're like, oh, I really like this animal, like that's an incentive for them to take it. Um, they're probably more inclined to share that with a friend and be like, look at this funny package I got. And like I said, we're also literally giving people a way to practice safe sex. Um, so it's just, I've got some fun pictures from previous events. So we've got a bearded dragon from a vet tech program in Colorado with a horned lizard package. Then we've got a hawk picking out its favorite condom package at an event um, at a wildlife center. And there's some of the other art. Uh, the California condor one, I see we got a question about the public submitting cute condom sayings. We actually had a whole contest on that last summer for our 10 year anniversary, where we picked, I believe 20 species that were, um, wanted to have the slogans focused on. So all of the species on the packages are North American species, particularly impacted by population growth. So we picked 20 additional species that, you know, fell into that category that weren't, you know, weren't already on the package. So, and then we received like 200 um, submissions of different slogans for the species. We picked our top five and then we let people vote and the condor was the one that won. And it was kind of like amazingly um, serendipitous because it was, like a month before that like 1,000th hatching of the condor program, so that was really cool. And these are all the packages we have. I think all these have been throughout the presentation already, but we've got for the sake of the horned lizard, slow down love wizard. We've got the hellbender, fumbling in the dark, think of the monarch, we've got the polar bear, before it gets any hotter, remember the sea otter, and can't refrain, remember the whooping crane. A few years ago, we also launched our Spanish condoms, you know, um, increase our reach, um, be more inclusive of other audiences. So <clears throat> I'm not gonna make you suffer through my Spanish, but the wolf one translates to protect the wolf, covering it all, and that's a Mexican wolf. Then there's save the vaquita, don't sow your seeds. And the vaquita is a really tiny porpoise off of um, the Western coast of Mexico, I think around like the Baja of California. They're really tiny and really cute. And they're also facing um, threats of bycatch from shrimp fishers. Uh, for the monarch, we've got cover your thing, protect the butterfly, and then save the bear, put on your hat for the polar bear. Um, and some other ones we've done, so I already explained the condor uh, contest. Um, the foot one we did in partnership with Global Footprint Network for Earth Overshoot Day. Um, they're an organization every year, they calculate um, the date of the year that we would use up all the Earth's resources. It usually falls in the summer. So we're always, what it means is we're using the resources before the Earth, the earth can regenerate them. Um, and they talk about population as well. Um, so we, they asked us if they could um, do their own condom package if they came up with slogans and they had this one of before your seduction thing footprint reduction. Um, a lot of their campaigns are about the different steps we can take to reduce our footprint. So um, that is all I have for my presentation. I just wanted to highlight a few resources that we have if you want to learn more about the work we do. Um, so if you think the endangered species condoms are awesome and you want to hand them out, um, you know, whether it's safely socially distanced right now um, or amongst people in your pod, um, you can go to endangeredspeciescondoms.org and sign up. Um, if you are interested in more of this research, we have a whole database called crowdedplanet.org and that um, right now has almost 100 different papers. I've summarized them all. <laughs> um, they talk about just all the various impacts of human population on wildlife habitat, the environment. Um, and there's also um, a lot of papers about all these effective solutions around women's empowerment, education, and access to uh, contraception. We also have our wildlife-friendly wedding guide. 
So if you go to wildlifefriendlywedding.org, we have a whole free guide about how you can have a more sustainable wedding. Um, Cause we also deal with consumption. So we were looking at that. And then it's also, you know, introducing the topic of family planning to people, potentially younger couples getting married. Um, we have our holiday guides, simplifytheholidays.org. There's gift guides and all kinds of stats and facts about consumption around the holidays. Um, there's some fun shareables right there um, now for Valentine's Day. And there's also a resource within that called the SoKide Registry that is a registry platform that encourages alternative gift giving, like secondhand gifts, gifts of time, service. Um, so that's a really fun resource. Um, I have all of our social media handles. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. Uh, and I have my email in case you have any follow-up questions after the fact. Um, and I'd say at the end of our social media right now, we, are, we have a virtual film screening we're doing this week and a panel discussion next Thursday. The movie is To Kid or Not to Kid, and it's a documentary filmmaker kind of looks at the cultural and societal pressures people have and what goes into people's family planning decisions. So if you sign up for that, again, you can find that on our Facebook. Um, I could potentially try to find the link really quick and put it in the chat. <laughs> um, sign up for that, you'll get a link to watch the movie and then next Thursday night, um, 7 p.m. Eastern, we will have a panel discussion with the director um, and a few other experts in the area. area. So that is it. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Do you guys have any questions? You can start, oh, we have one already popped up. Oh, what is my favorite thing about my job? I, I mean, I like doing presentations like this where I get to like tell people about the fun work we do. Um, population, it's interesting that like, it is this like big pervasive issue that kind of used to be a big topic in the environmental movement like in the seventies and then kind of fell out. So it's, while I wish it wasn't always new information for people, it usually is. <laughs> so it's, it, it's nice to help people make that connection and kind of like see how there's like individual decisions like your family plan decisions make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then also that we advocate for these larger changes, like also advocate for comprehensive sex ed in your school districts or access contraception for everyone. So there's just like all these different levels you can work on in this arena. No, you, you meant, well, I mentioned, I guess in your bio, you were working on your ma a second master's degree, but it's yes. not in a biological topic, right? It's not, yeah, I had um, a, <laughs> First master's in biology studying right. behavior. And then um, just as I was, you know, when I was a lab coordinator wanting to, and always working in nonprofits on the side, just wanted more formal training in that. So I, fin I did finish that degree. <laughs> um, that's what I was gonna say, because I, I think your bio on uh, the website's outdated. So <laughs> I gotta the, get on that. Center's website, because your title's wrong on the center's website. So. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, but it is correct on your LinkedIn page. So. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> Off you. <laughs> no, it's good research. Um, you know, the cool thing was um, my master's program required an internship, which I started at the center and then I got hired from there. So that was like a very cool way to kind of come into this work. And my whole internship was focused on the condoms project. Oh, nice. So I've kind of, that's been like, like the consistent thread through my, um, through my work here. And if you did sign up for our uh, Frolics of Florida uh, tour this weekend um, at the museum, you will be receiving condoms as part of your uh, little gift bag. So um, some of Sarah's condoms. So that's a fun little thing if you wanna gift baggy. Um, any other questions? You guys are, I always say this, you're always quiet. Always takes you a few minutes to get going. Nothing about carbon footprint. Can I ask the audience questions? Absolutely. Does anyone know? So for, um, well, one, I guess I can ask what kind of, did you have comprehensive sex ed when you were growing up in school? Um, or did you have, abs I guess there's abstinence only, abstinence plus, mm -hmm. they like, really push absence, but do let you know there's other options out there or were you, was everything explained to you? I know I had comprehensive. They had like a little like toolbox of demos of all the things. Okay, we have one that says abstinence. 
I had abstinence only. So I'm surprised because Alice is a bit younger than me. Shelby says abstinence only. Ah, Patty says no training at all. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that's um I so I um grew up so it was I had was in high school in the early aughts in um like suburbs of Philadelphia and we had comprehensive. So I just assumed like time period wise, yeah, like that's what everyone got. But I definitely mm -hmm. Arizona, I found out not the case at all. No, so no, not at abstinence all. only. <laughs> No, of course, I'm, like I said, I'm quite a bit older than you, but um, yeah, no, we didn't have that. And of course, it was a very small town, and that may have been part of it, I don't know, but um, yeah, it was abstinence only, so. Um, anybody else got any questions? Anybody about our animals or anything at the museum we can answer for you? I know she talked about the panthers. We have two Florida panthers. Oh, awesome. Are there any animals we should put on the condoms that we you did not see in tonight's presentation? Well, I Allison would love for you to put on the red. Oh, Shelby would also love for you to put on our red wolves. Oh, yeah. It's one of those like because we have the Mexican wolf now. It's like try to like have like somewhat more. <laughs> Yeah, we have a Red Wolf uh, breeding program. We're part of the SSP, so. Oh, cool. Well, that is something, I mean, like I said with the partnerships, if there's ever like, you want to make a Florida museum kind of pack, mm -hmm. then you we pick one. We should do one, that would be fun. <laughs> um, Benita wants to know, do you ever work with nonprofits like Planned Parenthood? Yes, we do. Um, that Yeah, I guess that, that's another fun thing I get to do in my job is like the diversity of partnerships we have is amazing. Um, so when I was in Arizona, we partnered with Planned Parenthood of Southern Arizona and did like a series of presentations. Kind of, it was like we invited support, you know, uh, it was like a few different cities around Arizona and we invited uh, members and support of each members and supporters of each organization and kind of explained like how these um, issues are intersectional. So, hey, like, if you like the environment, you should also support um, reproductive rights because that, you know, that's a solution to uh, population growth. So we've done that. And then, um, so I'm in Buffalo. I've also, I did like a presentation for um, one of the local ones here for their after school program for teens. So we talked about it. Um, I've done a Girl Scout patch program. We don't give up, I don't get to give out the condoms there, but like to high school, we talk about how like population impacts, women's empowerment, making choices. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you said, uh, works with their local Planned Parenthood chapter. Mm -hmm. um, we're always looking to connect with the different regional areas. The girls, well, I wonder if, I mean, the Girl Scout program though, if it was a high school program, you'd think they would tie into their sex ed class and you would be able to give out the condoms then, I guess. You think, I think it's just because <laughs> like under the umbrella, like the Girl Scout. there yeah. might be like maybe by different councils, right? Cause that's like another regional like I worked with like the Council of Western New York okay um it might be sort of like a personal um yeah it, it's all very regional and sometimes like the school yeah, districts you're right <laughs> and, and Girl I was Scouts, like it's, they it's there if you their, want to but I totally get when there's limits you're right it changed and our Girl Scouts change their programming all every day so um in the current political climate do you receive any kind of backlash surrounding this topic and how do you approach that problem kind of problem oh man I mean <laughs> All kinds of, I mean, there, there's lots of different kinds of back. Um, let me list the, I mean, there's some people like, it's it's better uh -huh. administration. Like a lot of bad policy is getting corrected, which is exciting. Uh -huh. um, but like an example is like some people um, don't, they might support some reproductive rights, but still may not be um, pro-choice. Uh -huh. So people who still don't disagree with that portion, we are, we think abortion is part of the suite of options for contraception. We believe that is essential health care. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I will say most people are like, I wouldn't call it backlash as so much as like disagreement and like we have a polite exchange and if it doesn't make sense to partner or work together. Um, oh, okay. Um, I think I said better question is what would be a good way to open communication on this topic? Mm -hmm. I have been trying to work on myself for this and my volunteers of active listening. So if someone brings a concern to you of why they are, why they may think this is not a, like why they don't wanna work on population, like really listening to what their concerns are. There's a lot of um, 
So kind of how I talked about misconceptions that some people think this is an inherently racist topic because there are group there are specific groups who've been targeted, um, whether it's marginalized communities. Um, yeah, listening to like there there have been like actions of population control taken against different groups, whether um, you know the forced sterilizations of Black and Brown people, of ind of Indigenous women, of the hysterectomies happening in ICE detention centers, like last year. Mm -hmm. um, so just like listening and recognizing that like those concerns are valid, um, and then you can say your piece about how we are focusing on the rights based solutions and. Um, wanting everyone to be empowered with access and resources and not wanting to target any group in particular. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answers that. Yeah, you know, I, I, this is kind of off topic, but um, the, I, I, where I recently did an exhibit on equal rights and um, for women and women, the women's right to vote and um, dealing with the 19th amendment. And it, of course the Equal Rights Amendment never passed um, because all the states never ratified it. Of course, the US Senate ratified it and the government ratified the US government ratified it, but the states never ratified it. And Florida was a state that didn't didn't ratify it. And they kept coming up in in the Florida government and uh, year after year they kept debating it and um, uh, watching some oral histories of the um, house speaker and whatnot um and they were women and they would say you know we voted against it because would that mean we had to pay for our own dinner would that mean we had to you know we would be the ones that had to stay home and take care of our kids if we had you know we can't work with its equal rights and and so it was i mean there's a big misconception through history about the whole concept so I think that's part of this discussion as well, in terms of Planned Parenthood and um, women's rights, and you know, putting yourself first. So um, I think that's part of this whole discussion. Yeah, there was. A, we recently did. We started like a new little series on our YouTube channel called Contraception Conversations, and it all started with. One of my male coworkers letting me know who's getting a vasectomy, which is like this is like the run of the mill weird emails I get <laughs> so regularly. She's like, just want to let you know, no one if you like want me to do anything around it. I'm like, can I interview you and like you and your wife and like talk about your family planning decisions? Mm -hmm. And like when you look at vasectomies compared to like tubal ligation, which like so the male and female counterparts of mm -hmm. um, permanent birth control, mm -hmm. um, vasectomies are cheaper, like more effective, less recovery time, and still like tubal ligations happen three times as much. Huh. Um, and I was like, okay, like wh why? <laughs> I think like not a ton of like scientificness to put or like evidence behind it, but ultimately like women go to the doctor more. So if they, they're the ones pursuing it, like the onus of um, family planning and contraception usually falls on them. Uh -huh. And there's all sorts of like, you know, masculinity things wrapped up in that as well. But like, equity of family planning. So at least like the men I interviewed who got vasectomies did have like the nice perspective. They're like, my wife was on birth control for like 15, 20 years. Right. It's my turn to do something. I'm like, that's great. Mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> but just like kind of getting that education out there, like correcting misconceptions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not all on women. Right. Uh, Benita wants to know if you um, target groups like girls and boys clubs. I'm not sure if she targets the right. Oh, I mean, like, I think I've worked with them in the sense I've had volunteers sign up, like, who've, like, been volunteers with their local Boys and Girls Club, say, hey, I have to give up condoms with them. I haven't done any work personally with them, but, like, that'd be a cool one to work with if we could, like, work with schoolers. It's just tricky as, like, it's great being a national organization, but, like, a lot of that is, like, better facilitated in in-person, like, on-the-ground work, mm -hmm. uh, which I do try to do locally when it's not a pandemic. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Now, how did you end up on a reservation? You said you're on. Uh, a oh, sorry, that was just like a land acknowledgement for Indigenous people. Okay. It's like recognizing okay. the like the land you're on. I'm not on a reservation. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know if the if you were actually living there. <laughs> no, this is my background. Is a uh, this is your background? Okay. In Western New York, it's part of like a state park. <laughs> right. Okay, I was like, how did you end up? Okay, because you said that. Okay. Any other questions, guys? No.
All righty. Well, I guess I will close us out then. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us this evening. And, you, and please uh, check out Sarah next week on Thursday evening, uh, one hour, well, almost 15 minutes from now. Um, Easter, oh, Shelby says, great talk. Thank you. Um, and we will be here again um, with Tallahassee Museum on March 11th with Nicole Grennan from the Florida Public Archaeology Network um, talking about myths and mysteries of, in Florida archaeology. Um, March is Florida Archaeology Month, so um, we're going to focus on some neat finds in our own state. Um, so uh, you can register on our website or um, we will be sending out, of course, our usual e-blast um, and putting on it on Facebook and Instagram. So I look forward to seeing you all um, in a few weeks. Everybody take care and stay healthy. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.